All right, my name is uh, Keith St. Clair. I teach political science here at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, I'm glad to be here today to talk about uh, the professional development grant that I got uh, with the help of the GRCC Foundation. Last summer, I was able to travel to uh, Taiwan and uh, Shanghai, China uh, to compare the, uh, the political systems, the history, the culture between those two societies and, uh, and use that information in the, my comparative government classes um, and international relations classes that I teach here at GRCC. And uh, so I'll start off here with my first slide. I have uh, photos of the two respective flags. Uh, the one on the left is the uh, flag of the People's Republic of China. That's uh, what we've traditionally known as communist mainland China. And the flag on the right is the uh, current flag uh, flown in Taiwan, which is the, uh, the Republic of China's is its official name. Uh, we often just call it Taiwan. But it's interesting that both states um, claim the other's territory. Um, and the United States has always had just a one China policy. For a long time, well, after World War II, we recognized the government on Taiwan as being the proper government of all of China when the communists took over the mainland. And it really wasn't until the 1970s that we switched and recognized the communist government in Beijing, the capital of mainland China, as the proper government of all of China. The United States does not recognize Taiwan and China to be different territories. We, we just... Uh, we recognize one government's legal claim to both. And we've just switched uh, in the 20th century over which political government we thought was the proper government of China. So when we say that the United States has a one China policy, what we mean is that we recognize one government of China over both of these territories. The problem is that they don't see it that way, or I should say they see it that way, but they each lay claim to the other's territory. Let me put it that way. So here you have uh, Taiwan uh, on the island of Formosa, and, uh, and here you have mainland China with its government here in Beijing. The government on Taiwan ruled from the government in Taipei, and uh, each laying claim to the other's territory. Now, you know, China was ruled by the Qing Dynasty, which was the Manchu people who conquered uh, China. The Manchurians lived up here in the north. They came down, conquered all of China, and theirs was the last ruling dynasty of China, the, the, last, the last emperors. And, um, and that ended in 1911 with the Chinese Revolution, when China became a republic. And one person who's credited with that revolution, not the only person, but the one person who was the, kind of the visionary figure, who's sometimes referred to as the father of China, the Chinese Republic, is uh, Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen uh, lived in China. He had advocated for a constitutional government and then later uh, a constitutional monarchy at first and then later advocated for doing away with the emperor and just creating a republic. And it was his vision even though he lived uh, during that time much in exile, uh, it was his vision that eventually led to the Chinese Revolution, creating the Chinese Republic. The emperor was, in effect, deposed in 1911. And although he continued, he was actually really a boy at that time, uh, he continued to live in the Forbidden City for many years after that, before he was finally forced to leave. The emperor had no legal authority after that. Uh, unfortunately for Sun Yat-sen, his vision uh, was frustrated by the fact that with the overthrow of the emperor, various warlords took over parts of China, and China was engulfed in civil war for much of the 19-teens and early 1920s. And uh, it would really only be near his death in 1925 um, that Sun Yat-sen's vision of a united China would come about. Uh, under his Nationalist Party, but it would be his successor, Chiang Kai-shek, who would unify China uh, by around 1927. Here you have the memorial to Sun Yat-sen in Nanking, uh, China, which is just west of Shanghai, which is where I spent most of my time last summer, Shanghai and Taipei, Taiwan. 
But I got a, a chance to go to Nanking, which was historically the southern capital of China. And this is where you find Sun Yat-sen's memorial. And it's interesting that both the communist government on the mainland and the Republic of China government on Taiwan both recognize Sun Yat-sen as a founding figure. They both revere him as a revolutionary, as someone who brought about the end of the, uh, of, the, of the dynasties, of the Manchu dynasty, and forming the republic. And they both, they both um, uh, consider him a historical hero. And here you see his mausoleum. It's actually up very high. Here's a look down from the top, uh, looking back on the city of Nanking. And here's his uh, statuette inside the mausoleum. Now, Sun Yat-sen was a leader of the Nationalist Party. And uh, it's the Nationalist uh, Party that ended up being exiled to Taiwan when the communists took over. And this is probably the only spot in all of mainland China today, since it's now run by the communists, that you'd even see a symbol of the nationalist flag. It's actually right above his head. If you went in here, the mausoleum, and looked straight up, you would see the nationalist flag symbol uh, that is now part of uh, Taiwan's flag. Um, and it's in, of course, it's in marble, so it's not like they could just take the flag down. Uh, here you have the communist flag of mainland China, of the People's Republic of China. And here you have modern day Shanghai. Um, most of the seminar I attended was in Shanghai, the rest of it was in Taipei, but it was my first time to Shanghai, even though I had been to China before, I'd never been to Shanghai, and I must say, it really is a modern city in all respects. I mean, it is kind of the New York City of China. Um, that's all I can really compare it to. I mean, it's that cosmopolitan. It's that world class. It really uh, has a lot to offer anyone from anywhere in the world uh, as far as culture, uh, museums, architecture, technology, everything. And this is... Uh, this is looking upon, this is kind of the newer part of Shanghai. Um, and probably about 30 years ago, that would have probably, none of that would have been there. None of it. And now you've got these, uh, uh, these you know, architectural towers that, you know, rival any architecture in the world. It's also Shanghai is the financial center of China. Uh, the Shanghai Stock Exchange is very important. And here you see a symbol of the bull that, that you would see even in the outside of the New York Stock Exchange. Again, you know, hopefully, hoping for a bull market. I saw Tesla dealerships in Shanghai. Uh, I certainly haven't seen those in Michigan. Um, Again, the architecture is, is quite remarkable. The subways, very clean in Shanghai, very safe. Glass doors so that you don't fall on the tracks. Um, electronic displays saying when the next train is arriving. Um, first class all the way, uh, the subways in Shanghai. And I couldn't help but think of the comparison because when I got back, and I flew into Chicago, you know, here is uh, Chicago's uh, L, right? And we just really don't hold up as far as some of our aging infrastructure uh, really needs to be updated. Uh, here in the United States, in Chicago, I mean, you could easily fall on the tracks. Uh, there's no protective shielding. And it just frankly, it just looks run down. So, um, it, I mean, the one thing about a, a new thriving city like Shanghai is it really has, you know, a lot of the latest uh, amenities and technology and, and infrastructure. Bread. This was a bakery in Shanghai, and uh, our uh, facilitators there told us that before 2002, you would never have seen a bakery selling bread in, uh, in Shanghai, let alone the rest of the China. But... Um, uh, the Chinese have developed a, ta a Western taste for bread. And so, because Shanghai has become such a cosmopolitan city, such an international city once again, that uh, again, bread and bakeries are now popular in Shanghai, which you would not have seen prior to 2002. 
This is the Bao Steel Factory outside of Shanghai that we had a chance to visit. And uh, it's actually in the process of being moved. Um, it's going to be moved. But outside of Shanghai, the major steel production center, Bao Steel, uh, makes a lot of steel for sale around the rest of the world. It is one of the few um, uh, industries that's still state owned in China. I must say that even though China's run by the Communist Party today, they're scarcely practicing communism. I mean, they have really adopted capitalism in most respects um, and done it very well uh, and very competitively on a world stage. But the steel industry is apparently um, considered such a, an issue of national security that it's still run by the state, state-owned enterprise. and. Although they still make a lot of steel, they were, as they gave me a tour of this factory, they were, they were kind of bragging about how uh, last year their profits were $1. They, the company made $1. And they just thought that was funny. I found it horrifying, frankly, because what it tells me is that you know, there's a lot, uh, they don't have to run a profit um, because it is state run, subsidized by the state, you know, my fear is that they could easily undercut foreign prices. Um, you know, what we um, maybe selling the steel maybe below cost. I mean, certainly the allegations of international dumping. Dumping is where you sell a product on the international market below the cost of making it. I'm not sure that's what they're doing here, but it, it raises questions. Uh, the only reason to do that, of course, because you'd lose money, the only reason to do that is to enhance your market share drive your competitors, uh, competitors out of business, then you can raise prices later. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that they move, they're moving this out of Shanghai because of the air pollution in China. I mean, and certainly Shanghai is a model city for them now. It's an international city. Um, people come there from all over the world. They really want to clean up the air around Shanghai. So they're moving the factories, like this Bao Steel factory, they're all going to be eventually moved out to hopefully improve the air quality around Shanghai. Here's uh, some of our facilitators uh, for the faculty. And we had faculty from all across the country. There are about 16 of us uh, that travel around. And these were our group leaders. Uh, the man on the left, uh, uh, Steve Chow, he is actually uh, Taiwanese. Um, but he married a Shanghai girl. So he's now. Uh, um, living most of his uh, time in Shanghai. This shows you uh, a, hist a historic hotel, the Peace Hotel, uh, in its heyday in the 1920s. This is a present day photo, but in its heyday in the 1920s, international entertainers stayed there. Um, Charlie Chaplin was known to have stayed there. Inside, it's got a, a kind of an art deco atmosphere and historic photos of famous guests. Here you see the interior. And these ladies, I thought, were dressed to the period. I had to take a photo of them. In the 1920s and 1930s, Shanghai was also a very international city. And that was something that I definitely learned. Um, here it is on the banks of the, of the, of, uh, the Bund, as they call it, which is the banks of the Hong Pao Hungpu River that flow into the Yangtze, which is not very far away, which is why Shanghai is a major port, a major export port. And you also see some uh, architecture of the golden uh, Buddhist temples in Shanghai. Here he had uh, persons uh, performing their, um, playing their instruments on the streets. Uh, exercises in the parks, their Tai Chi. And this one was uh, some sort of competition. Uh, these, they were all dressed alike. They were uh, competing in some sort of performance right there on the banks of the Boon with their um, fan. And here you see uh, kind of, this shows you Shanghai relative to the Yangtze River. This is the Yangtze River dumping into the ocean. And this uh, Hungpu River that flows into the Yangtze is what makes Shanghai 
and gives it access to uh, international exports. And this is the city of Shanghai sprung up here. And actually, historically, um, you know, the British ended up gaining a concession. Actually, a lot of the British, the French, the Americans all gained tra trade concessions during the days of the, uh, the last Chinese dynasty in the early 1800s, really, after the Opium War, where um, the British defeated the Chinese government um, <laughs> because the, the British were attempting to deal opium, sell opium to the Chinese, because that was the only product that apparently the Chinese wanted to buy. Although the Chinese emperor didn't like it, tried to restrict the trade, it caused a war, Britain won. Part of the concessions they got was not only Hong Kong, but they also got a concession, trade concessions here in Shanghai. So this is what ended up making Shanghai an international city. The French would also gain a concession here, and the Americans. The, the British concession was about here, the French concession was about here, and then the American concession was about here. The Americans got the concession when we, California became a state in 1850, we became Pacific power. And so uh, America all of a sudden was looking to the Pacific and trade opportunities. And so we established a concession in Shanghai at that time. It didn't last very long before we ended up merging it with the British concession because of the Civil War. Um, here I can show you, this was the British had the most built up area of all of the uh, concessions. They poured the most money into Shanghai in the mid 19th century. Um, obviously they planned to stay. Um, this is uh, the current photo of the, of the Bund. Um, Boon is actually a Hindu word, came from, um, um, well, the British controlled India. So uh, they, they, they kind of used the Hindi, uh, the Hindu word for the embankment. And, um, and so they still call it the Boon in, uh, in Shanghai today. This would have been the French concession. The French concession was more middle class. The British concession was more upper class and wealthier. And the American concession was the poorest, uh, low-class factory workers. Um, uh, and also, eventually, a um, sanctuary for Jews who would flee Europe. And this is a, a, a building that they made into a synagogue, actually. The Americans left or merged their concession with the British in the midst of the Civil War, because a lot of the Americans who were here went back to fight in the Civil War. So not having enough people to really run it, they kind of merged it with the British, because the British culturally were similar and they, they, they were better administrators. So later in the early 19th century, when Jews started to flee Europe, many of them came to Shanghai because they didn't actually need a, uh, they didn't need a passport really. They just needed um, a visa to get out of the countries that they were leaving. And Shanghai, because it was an international city, was some place they could go. And a lot of Jews took sanctuary here to avoid the Holocaust that was coming in Europe by the end of the 1930s and early 40s. And this is now uh, a museum. Uh, highlighting the, uh, the Jews' uh, journey here and um, seeking sanctuary against uh, the Nazis. But of course, G Germany was an ally of Japan, and Japan had designs on China during World War II as well. In fact, Japan had already attacked China well before Europe, World War II, had actually started. Um, Around 1937, the Japanese, Japanese seized all of the areas around Shanghai, and they, moved, they made their move on Nanking, the southern capital of China, further inland. And uh, Shanghai was something that the Japanese hoped to claim in total when war would begin with the United States, the British. Um, but prior to that, um, they wanted to teach the Chinese a lesson, and Nanking b became the lesson that they were going to teach the Chinese. Shanghai, they were going to preserve as a jewel in their empire, the Japanese. But Nanking, they wanted to make an example of. And sometimes in history, we refer to it as the rape of Nanking, 
because the Japanese assault was so brutal. Uh, not only did they defeat the Chinese army, uh, the Chinese nationalist army there, but they also uh, uh, massacred a vast number of the population. And this is a museum in Nanking to, that, uh, to the slain people who died. And here they had body, well, bones on display in the very places of the mass graves where they were buried. And that's not something they would do out of, um, as, a, as a sign of respect in the United States, but apparently in China this is uh, something that they didn't mind displaying and showing firsthand the, uh, the atrocities that the Japanese had committed when they uh, took Nanking in World War II. In fact, they had uh, this, uh, the Red Swastika Society and many other international societies, including the Red Cross, um, went to help the victims of the massacre in Nanking. Now, I was a little taken aback by this at first until I realized that the swastika in Asia, again, is a Buddhist symbol. It's not considered to be an evil symbol that is um, that tainted by the memory of Adolf Hitler. Um, the swastika prior to the coming of Adolf Hitler was a very positive symbol through much of the world, India, Asia. It's unfortunate that the Nazis and Adolf Hitler have given this symbol an evil meaning in the West, but in much of the rest of the world it doesn't have that connotation. So the Red Swastika Society in Asia was kind of the equivalent of the American Red Cross, helping victims of tragedy, be they natural or man-made. This is the walls of Nanking that, were, that have been rebuilt, but they were actually flattened by the Japanese um, when it was evacuated. And here you had a, a street sweeper using not the most modern um, uh, broomstick. But um, it was during World War II that Chiang Kai-shek, the successor of Sun Yat-sen, the leader of the nationalist forces and ally of the United States and the British against the Japanese, Chiang Kai-shek led the Chinese armies against the Japanese armies during World War II. Unfortunately for him, after World War II, his nationalist forces would be um, uh, outmaneuvered politically by Mao Zedong and his communist forces. And the communists would end up taking over of mainland China, China by 1949, forcing the nationalists, with their flag, to leave and set up a government in exile in Taiwan. So they fled to the island of Formosa, what we now recognize as Taiwan, and set up their government in exile there, calling it the Republic of China. And with the help of the United States, mainland China was never actually in a position to actually take it. So that explains why the two uh, political entities remain separate today. So Chiang Kai-shek took his nationalist forces, he fled to Taiwan, the communists then took over the mainland. And at least initially, the U.S. continued to recognize only one Chinese government, and that government being the nationalist government that fled to Taiwan. And it would only be much later when we realized that this government was never going to be able to take back all of this territory, and we ended up succumbing to reality and recognizing the Chinese government. Also note that the fact that um, really up until World War II, the Japanese had acquired Taiwan in the Sino-Japanese War of um, 1895. They had taken it from the Chinese emperor, and they had occupied Taiwan all the way up until World War II. It was only after the, with the Japanese loss of World War II that Taiwan was given back to mainland China at the time run by Chiang Kai-shek's government. Here you see the beauty of the island of Formosa. In fact, Formosa means beautiful uh, island. Uh, it was given to them by the, that name by the, the Portuguese. Um, 
we sometimes just refer to the, 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 the state that runs it as Taiwan, but it is beautiful and it is very mountainous in the interior. Here's our group, um, part of our group anyway, standing inside of a, in front of a Buddhist temple on Taiwan. And actually a lot of Buddhist temples also doubled as Taoist temples. Uh, both, um, uh, both are different religions. Buddhism came from India initially, where the Buddha actually lived. Um, Taoism actually kind of predated that, but kind of came in a, into its own as a, as a Chinese faith. Unlike many Western religions, in many Eastern religions are not mutually exclusive. So like we in the West, we would either be, we could be a Christian, or we could be a Jew, or we could be a Muslim. But you couldn't be more than one. But in Chinese tradition, they, they don't have that. They don't see religion as exclusive. So someone can practice Taoist uh, religious beliefs as well as Buddhist religious beliefs. And they're not, uh, they're very much complementary. They're, uh, they're not exclusive religions. So a lot of temples, in this case in Taiwan, would also have a Taoist portion and as well as a Buddhist portion. And these are some Taoist priests uh, conducting a ceremony inside the temple. And I think most Americans maybe are familiar with the Taoist symbol of yin and yang. Um, basically, the Taoists believe that um, the universe is, is basically made up of two uh, forces that are, need to be in balance for things to be going well. It's, uh, it's when these yin and yang are out of balance uh, that the bad things happen. And yet yin and yang are constantly becoming each other. Uh, one has a female dimension, one is a male, one is um, uh, dark, one is light. And so it's that that brings balance to the world. Here you have uh, another temple in Taiwan. This one, um, people bringing sacrifices of food, laying them out for the, the deities, and then conducting their prayers. Here they're throwing um, divination blocks uh, on the ground. One has a flat side, the other is a concave side. And, um, and so depending on how they fall, you'd get your answer. You'd, you'd ask your question to the deity, and then you'd throw down, and you'd get either a yes or a no or try again. Um, and those are what the blocks that she's throwing down on the ground. These are some crypts uh, um, uh, for burial that um, outside one of the cities in near Taipei. And here you had a uh, an incense holder. Um, as you burn the incense and get your prayers are taken up to heaven, as the smoke takes your um, prayers up to heaven. And so this one was a rather beautiful device with its ornate dragons. Again, this shows you the mountainous uh, of, of the interior of Taiwan, although you can see the ocean in the background. Some of the very steep streets of some of these uh, cities that are in that part of Taiwan. And this is an old uh, abandoned uh, Japanese gold mine that the Japanese built during their occupation. Um, like I said, the Japanese acquired, defeated the Chinese army and acquired Taiwan in 1895. And they held it until the end of World War II. So that's quite a, a span of years there. And the Japanese were able to really economically develop the island. And uh, this gold mine was one such legacy of that. In fact, um, even though the people on Taiwan were, um, I think they were, they, they saw the Japanese as foreigners, but they also saw economically what they brought. And although many of them were initially happy that Ch the Japanese lost World War II and that they would be reunited with their ethnic kin on the mainland, um, 
the nationalist government did not prove to be um, the government they, they had hoped for. In fact, uh, the nationalist government, when it fled to Taiwan, or even before it fled, seemed more intent on, um, after 1945, exploiting the island's resources to help rebuild the mainland at the expense of the people who were on the island. The people who were on the island of Taiwan are, um, well, it's uh, rather have mixed heritage, actually. The original aboriginal inhabitants of Taiwan were the Polynesians. They're the ones who went out and colonized much of the Pacific, Hawaii, um, um, all the way down to New Zealand. And, uh, and it's now determined that many of them came initially from Taiwan. There's not many of the original Aborigines left. Uh, they were replaced by ethnic Chinese who migrated across the Straits, um, well, even as far back as maybe 1000 AD. Uh, they, they were known as the Hakka-speaking people, and there's some of them that are still there. And then later in the 17th century, there was another mass migration um, from southern China, and they came with a, a different language. And that is the language that dominates on Taiwan today, which they just simply call Taiwanese. But um, on mainland China, it's known as Southern Min, or Minan. And, uh, and we, don't, we don't often think of it, but uh, when we learn Chinese here at GRCC or elsewhere, we, we're, we learn modern standard Chinese with the Beijing dialect Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese. What was interesting is that I don't speak Mandarin, but even when I traveled uh, to China, I guess it wouldn't have mattered too much if I did, because in Shanghai, that's not the, um, that's not the local language. Mandarin is not the local language. They call it Shanghaiese. And in Taiwan, most people don't speak Mandarin as their first language. They speak what they call Taiwanese. Um, With the coming of the Japanese, they got some economic development. But with the Japanese leaving, they had hoped for more from the nationalist government that replaced them. This is a uh, monument to the nationalist leader, Chiang Kai-shek, and the government that he ended up setting up in exile on this island. He would eventually die in the mid-1970s. And when, they, when he did, he had a similar mausoleum bought, built that was to me, very reminiscent of Sun Yat-sen, uh, the one I showed you earlier in Nanking. Chiang Kai-shek was a, uh, um, a lieutenant of Sun Yat-sen. He admired Sun Yat-sen, but he, didn't, uh, he doesn't have the reputation that Sun Yat-sen has. Certainly, the communists don't admire Chiang Kai-shek because they saw him as their enemy. And frankly, not many people in Taiwan have, or think very fondly of Chiang Kai-shek anymore either, because he was, from their point of view, kind of a ruthless dictator. But this monument, of course, would give someone else another impression. Um, and it's even larger than the monument to Sun Yat-sen in Nanking. Inside, you have a similar statue to Chiang Kai-shek. And here we have the changing of the guard, which is done every day. And there's the statue of uh, Chiang Kai-shek smiling. And the guards looking very serious and statuette. And this is also looking back at the uh, memorial to Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and this is the main entrance to the plaza. Well, before the communists took over the mainland, Chiang Kai-shek ruled on the mainland. And one of his lieutenants ran Taiwan. In 1947, there was a, uh, a mass protest movement against, by the people living on Taiwan against this governing authority. 
they they thought that they had it bad under the Japanese, but they realized that this new nationalist government was exploiting the island for its resources. They were not treating the people who lived on Taiwan very well. And there was an episode uh, where a woman was roughed up by, uh, for selling um, uh, black market cigarettes. And people on the streets rallied to her defense. And on the next day, on February 28th, massive protests broke out in Taipei that spread all the way around the island of Taiwan against this new nationalist government's uh, representative. And the nationalist government was very repressive and killed thousands of people. People were rounded up, arrested, mass executions. Uh, what's known as the February 28th incident is now well remembered. But for so long, when Chiang Kai-shek lived, it was covered up. It was not talked about. You weren't allowed to talk about it. Um, but now, as since the death of Chiang Kai-shek, and now that Taiwan is now a functioning democracy, people can now talk about the past in a way that they never could back then. And this is a memorial to the fallen, the people who were massacred by the nationalist government at that time. And actually, part of the monument, I thought, was reminiscent of Taiwan, Taiwanese, um, its Polynesian heritage. Uh, to me, this was, seemed very reminiscent of what I'd seen in much of Polynesia, where I've traveled. This has become a real um, uh, rallying point for tiny Taiwanese identity. This is the modern streets of Taipei. Um, it's a modern industrial society, uh, now a functioning democracy. Um, it doesn't have quite the uh, architecture of Shanghai, but this uh, Taipei is quite proud of what architecture it does have. This is uh, Taipei 101, um, and it's definitely a landmark in the city. And uh, I just love the architecture of this building, actually. The high-tech industry is just thriving on Taiwan. Um, this is one of the night markets. It is the thing to do in Taiwan. Um, even the locals, they love to go shopping for everything, clothes, food at night when the sun goes down. And, um, and foreigners are definitely um, encouraged to take part of this, in this part of their culture. These were some of our guides in Taipei. Of course, the cuisine wasn't always what I would prefer, but uh, this is um, squid that's for, uh, for sale. Here I am with our, my colleague. We're eating. Um, potstickers basically with uh, oyster omelet. Uh, so we had a chance to sample the local cuisine as well as the local beer. And this is the presidential palace in Taipei. Again, this is where the, the government was set up uh, that now runs Taiwan, the Republic of China. And uh, the Nationalist Party, uh, what's often called the Kuomintang, um, ruled for most of the 20th century. But with the coming of democracy, they no longer have a monopoly on political power. Um, and even though they, na they now have elections that uh, political parties that uh, the Democratic Progressive Party is currently in power, they won the elections last year, the Kuomintang lost. So um, they are currently ruling uh, the government. And here is the deputy of mainland affairs, uh, one of the uh, cabinet positions uh, in the current Taiwanese government. And here we are visiting. And um, 
under the Kuomintang uh, or the Nationalist Party, uh, things had improved as far as relations with the mainland. Uh, going back to 1992, uh, both countries basically came to an understanding that they, would, uh, they wouldn't recognize each other, but they would no longer deny uh, each other in a way that they would create some uh, relations. And um, that's, that's very nuanced. I mean, they don't recognize each other as a country, uh, but they do want to have some political interactions. And the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, was actually more in favor of that than the party that currently runs it. Um, last year, the Democratic Progressive Party, uh, and their president, Tsai Ing-wen, first female president, um, they're more in favor of independence for Taiwan. And that only upsets the communist government in Beijing. They do not like the idea of Taiwan ever becoming completely independent. They hope for reunification. The Nationalist Party for so long also hoped, the Kuomintang hoped for reunification. But now it's no, reunification is not as popular in Taiwan. Most Taiwanese seem to see themselves as culturally distinct and wanting to be independent. Well, with the coming of the new president being elected last year, uh, this uh, Ministry of Mainland Affairs has virtually nothing to do because um, the communist government on the mainland is no longer really wanting to talk uh, to this party that really seems to embrace the idea of independence. So uh, since last year, relations have now taken a turn for the worst again. I had always thought that, that most Chinese, excuse me, most Taiwanese saw themselves as Chinese and wanted to be reunified with the mainland. And that probably was true up until about 25 years ago. But with the coming of democratic government to Taiwan, uh, popular opinion is now of a different set. They, they don't, most people now seem to want independence. And I don't really hold out a lot of hope for there being a reunification if the people on Taiwan have anything to do about it. And part of the reason is, uh, is historical, and part of it, is, of course, is cultural. This is the, uh, uh, the National Museum there in Taipei, and it represents where Chiang Kai-shek, when he fled with his government in exile to Taiwan, he basically took all of the treasures from the Forbidden City in Beijing. Of course, he couldn't bring the Forbidden City, but he took all of the, the wealth of art and everything that was in it. And it's all really housed here. So you can go to mainland China, you can go to Beijing and see the Forbidden City, but if you want to see a lot of the art that was in it historically, this is where you need to come to see it. The communist mainland government, of course, wants it back. The government on Taiwan has no intention of ever giving it back. So here, this map of China and the surroundings kind of shows you the linguistic differences within China itself. As I said, Mandarin is the, is the language that most people know and is probably the, it's the lingua franca of all of China. But it also is the language of Beijing near the capital. But China has many different languages, although the Chinese government would be more likely to call them dialects. Uh, but other linguists say, no, they're really different languages. You know, you come down to uh, southern Min right here. Uh, in the 17th century, a lot of the people from this part of China settled Taiwan. And the, what, Pat, what they call the Taiwanese language on Taiwan today is basically this southern Min dialect, right? So if you come from Beijing up here in the north and you come to Taiwan, you don't speak the same language as most of the people who live there. Hakka uh, is over here. So um, Hakka also came prior to uh, Minan. So on Taiwan, you have about 14% of the people speaking Hakka. 
Uh, you have about 14% of the people speaking Mandarin, and that would have been the people, uh, the nationalist government that came and fled after the communists took over. And then the other 70% of the people speaking Minan or what they call Taiwanese on Taiwan. And uh, of course you have a few people, maybe less than 2% of the population speaking the aboriginal languages that would have been the forebearers of the Polynesian languages that I talked about. So you really kind of have an eclectic mix on Taiwan that I really didn't know about uh, so much prior to this trip. There's a lot of nuance here that's hard to explain. I guess the analogy that I'm going to use with my students is the following. Imagine if there was a communist takeover of the American government. And our Congress and the people in Washington, D.C. fled and set up a government in exile on Puerto Rico. The communists took over the mainland United States and ruled it from its capital, Washington, D.C and still lay claim to Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico is part of the United States territory. But the government in exile in Puerto Rico equally laid claim to all of the mainland territory, but really only had political control of the island of Puerto Rico. Those government officials from Congress who fled to Puerto Rico, they would speak English, right? But the language of the of the, the locals would have been Spanish in Puerto Rico. And yet it would have been the English officials who ruled uh, the government of Puerto Rico for so long. And they couldn't, they basically had to use a dictatorship because they couldn't have elections again <laughs> because none of the people on the island voted for them. That's what happened with Taiwan. Uh, between like when the communists took over the mainland in 1949 to when they finally had real elections again in the early 90s, they hadn't had any elections because the people in the government would have been voted right out by the people <laughs> on the island. Uh, because all the people who had elected the legislature that was ruling on Taiwan, they all lived here on the mainland. So I guess that's the analogy that I think works best. Um, uh, you know, you, I don't, I don't, know if there's any aboriginal people still left on Puerto Rico, but if there were, you would have had them. You would have had the Spanish-speaking people who came later from Europe uh, and spoke Spanish, and then you would have had this English coming from the mainland uh, from the government in exile that set up its government. And, and so that kind of is kind of the equivalent of what you've got here in Taiwan, right? You've got the original Aborigines who lived there, and then they were overwhelmed by the Chinese uh, migrations over the centuries, speaking both Hakka and Minan, and now, of course, since the communist takeover, Mandarin. But the vast majority of people on Taiwan today speak this dialect uh, of mainland China, which the people on Taiwan just simply call Taiwanese. Well. Thank you all for coming, and thanks uh, for listening to my presentation. It's been a privilege, and it certainly was a great trip, and I, I did learn a lot.